Start, please. This corner of the rubber squirt, now resume. Hi, Lord Chief Justice, Your Honorable Mr. Justice Brian Sachs, judges of the Court of Appeal, both present in this courtroom and in the other courtrooms in this building. Let me pause just for a moment to extend our condolences to our brother, Justice David Fraser, whose father passed away last evening. And we pray, and we pray for Justice Fraser and his family and lift them up in prayer at this difficult time. We also greet the Honorable Mr. Justice Ian Fort, Order of Jamaica, Command of the Order of Distinction, past President of the Court of Appeal of Jamaica, who is attending by way of the electronic platform. So is Ms. the Honorable Mr. Justice Seymour Panton, Order of Jamaica, Command of the Order of Distinction, also past president of the court, and also appearing by Zoom. Other retired judges of the Court of Appeal were attending by the various virtual platforms that we have the privilege of being able to use this morning. Judges of the Supreme Court of Judicature of Jamaica, both serving and retired, also attending on the electronic platforms. We want to specially mention the Honorable Mrs. Justice Zayla McCalla, retired Chief Justice, who fits in both categories, having served in, in both courts. The welcome to the senior puny judge, the Honorable Mrs. Justice Carol Beswick, who has also served as part of this court. The Chief Parish Court Judge, Mr. Chester Crooks, and judges of the Parish Court, both serving and retired. Senator Thomas Tavares Finson, Order of Jamaica, Command of the Order of Distinction, Queen's Council, Justice of the Peace, President of the Senate. The Honorable Mrs. Marissa Dalrymple Philbert, Speaker of the House of Representatives. The Honorable Mr. Derek McCoy, Queen's Council, Attorney General of Jamaica. Mr. The Honorable Mr. Delroy Chuck, Minister of Justice. The Honorable Ms. Marlene Malahu Fort, Minister of Legal Affairs, Constitutional Legal Affairs. The Honorable Ms. Paula Llewellyn, Queen's Counsel, Director of Public Prosecutions. Ms. Lisa White, Deputy Solicitor General, representing Solicitor General. Mrs. Denise Kitson, Queen's Counsel, Chairman of the General Legal Council. Mr. Alexander Williams, President of the Jamaican Bar Association. Mr. Leonard Green, President of the Advocates Association of Jamaica. Ms. Perlene Bailey, President of the Northern Bar Association, Mr. Michael Hemmings, President of the Cornwall Bar Association, Mr. George Clue, President of the Southern Bar Association. Distinguished members of the bar present in person 
and on the various virtual platforms. Members of staff of the Court of Appeal, representatives of the media present in person and on the electronic platforms, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, friends all. Having established the protocol, I trust that the individuals who will be called upon to speak will feel comfortable in the interest of time in accepting it. We are gathered this morning in continuation of the, our celebration of the 60th anniversary of this court. And as you will hear in a few minutes, the court was created by the Constitution of Jamaica, which came into effect on the, at the instant that the 6th of August, 1962, began. Just a few days before that date, however, on the 30th of July, 1962, the legislature of the day passed the Judicature Appellate Jurisdiction Law, which was brought into force on the 5th of August, 1962. The law created the structure in terms of judges and staffing and the jurisdiction of the court, although it did not technically exist until a few hours had elapsed. I suspect Dr. Lloyd Barnett may well know the answer to why that course was adopted. It is noticed that other institutions, including the Jamaica Defense Force, had a similar legislative passage. The judges of the court have compiled a condensed outline of the experiences of the court over the past 60 years. It will be read by Mrs. Kadish Jared Fletcher, the Director, Client Services, Communication and Information of the Court Administration Division of the Supreme Court. And I now call upon Mrs. Jared Fletcher. The Court of Appeal was established by the Constitution of Jamaica when the country gained its political independence from Britain on August 6, 1962. It is therefore, like Jamaica, celebrates its 60th anniversary on August 6, 2022. As you would have heard, the Court of Appeal, like the nation, is celebrating its 60th birthday. The court's structure and jurisdiction were, however, crafted by the law that was passed on July 30, 1962, and brought into effect on August 5 that year, one day before independence. The legislation regulating the court's authority and jurisdiction is now called the Judicature Appellate Jurisdiction Act, which will be referred to below as the Act. The court succeeded, it. The court succeeded a previous court meeting, which was part of the Court of Judicature. The former Court of Appeal was brought into effect by the Judicature Appellate, by the Judicature Court of Appeal Law, which was passed in 1935 and remained in effect with amendments until its repeal by the Act. Immediately before the change in 1962, an appellate tribunal was constituted by two judges of the Supreme Court sitting as a panel. The present court has no inherent jurisdiction. It derived property from the Constitution of Jamaica and from its enabling legislation, which also gives it all the powers that the previous court enjoyed. It hears appeals from all divisions of the Supreme Court of Judicature of Jamaica, as well as the parish court. There is also provision for appeals directly to the court from the decisions of certain bodies, such as courts, marshals, and regulatory bodies, such as the General Legal Council and the Public Accountancy Board. The court also has the benefit of the Court of Appeal rules for directing its procedures. The original Court of Appeal rules, which were created in 1962, was repealed in 2002 
at the same time that the civil procedure rules were promulgated. Despite the statement that the court has no inherent jurisdiction, it does have the jurisdiction. <laughs> That point was made in the court's judgment if Paul Chen Yong and others against Eagle Merchant Bank Jamaica Limited in 1962 and remains so today. The qualification to be a judge of court is 10 years of standing at the bar of Jamaica, England, Scotland, or Northern Ireland, or to have been a judge of a court of unlimited jurisdiction in civil and criminal matters in some part of the Commonwealth or a court having jurisdiction in appeals from any such court. The court, when it was established in 1962, comprised a president and three judges of appeal. In addition, the Chief Justice was and continues to be qualified by virtue of being head of the judiciary to sit as a member of the court. That may only occur, however, if the Chief Justice is invited by the President to so sit, and if at least four other judges of a people are also sitting as part of the court. That has so far only happened on ceremonial occasions. In 1967, the number of judges comprising the court, not including the President, was increased to six. That complement of seven remained unchanged for over 50 years. In 2008, legislation was passed to increase to 12 the maximum number of judges of appeal, not including the president, of which the court exists. Due to constraints of accommodation, however, the complement of seven was not increased until January 2019, when it was increased to 10, and the full complement of 13 was fulfilled for the first time on Monday, January 18, 2021. A panel at the Court of Appeal usually consists of three judges. In exceptional cases, more judges of appeal, typically five, may sit to hear a case. Two divisions of the court usually sit to hear cases. In addition to the judges, the court has a staff of 49 persons, including the registrar, the deputy registrar, and 14 other attorneys at law. 13 of the attorneys at law perform, their, perform the services of judicial clerks to the judges of the court. The 14 assist the registrar in the administration, the registry. When the new court was constituted in 1962, it continued to be located in the same building that houses the Supreme Court, and as time progressed, occupied various areas there. In 1997, the court relocated across to King Street, where it was sandwiched between the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions and the In January 2019, it moved to its which had been previously occupied by the Accountant General's Department. The entrance to the court's registry is on Barry Street. The court rooms are on the first floor and the other on Heath Street. Highlights in history. There have been a number of notable events during the course of the court's lifetime. A few of these are a panel of five judges has presided on more than one occasion in significant criminal appeals. Among those cases were the landmark cases of Paul Samuda against the Queen, Judgment delivered in 1988, dealing with the constitutionality of a sentence of corporal punishment, and the Peter de Gaulle against the Queen, dealing with the procedure involved in an application for the imposition of the death penalty. Only one civil appeal has seen a panel of five judges presiding. It is Clark against the Bank of Nova Scotia Jamaica Limited 2013. It dealt with the constitutionality of a procedural appeal being heard by a single judge of the court as the 2002 Court of Appeal rules had stipulated. 
Traditionally, the judges would wear black gowns for civil cases and scarlet robes for criminal cases. In 1993, black gowns were replaced. Black gowns replaced the other that were worn for all cases. In 2013, the traditional black gowns were replaced by gowns which included all of the national colors. The judges of the court ceased wearing traditional bench weights in December 2011. The first female judge of appeal was the was Honorable Miss Justice Marjorie Morgan. She was appointed in 1988 and served until her retirement in 1995. Shortly after her appointment, the court issued a practice direction that counsel in addressing Justice Morgan directly should say, Nilly, or your ladyship, as appropriate. However, when addressing a panel which comprised the ladyship, counsel were directed to say, your lordships. The first time an all-female panel sat in court was on May 3, 2010. It comprised Justices Harris, Phillips, and McIntosh. On January 13, 2014, there were, for the first time, more female judges on the court than males. Justices Phillips, McIntosh, Lawrence Beswick acting, and Manda acting comprised the majority. Males have been in the minority since the cadre of judges was increased from seven in 2019. There have been 12 presidents of the court, including the incumbent, since 1962. They have all been males. The first three divisions for the first time in 2019, when it moved to its new location, which hosts three court rooms. The heading of judgments in appeals from convictions and sentences in criminal cases in the court up to July 2008 took the format of the Queen against X. From that time, consistent with the fact that the convicted person was the appellant, the format was changed to X against the Queen. 2008 also brought about the beginning of the standardization of the format of judgments of the court. In January 2010, neutral citations were introduced for the judgments of the court. The court sat for the first time outside of Kingston during the week of December 9, 2013. The historic sitting took place at the Resident Magistrates Court in Lucy in the parish of Hanover. Sittings have taken place every year since that time up to 2020 when it was halted because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And in some years, there were more than one sittings. All were in Lucy in the parish of Hanover. The onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020 forced the court to cease in-person hearings as its standard procedure. Sittings have since been had. The sittings have since had to be conducted on an electronic platform with the parties and counsel attending the court virtually while the judges sat in courts attended by court personnel. And onto the future is committed to supporting the initiative of the judicial by the chief justice. That initiative has as its vision to be the best in the Caribbean and among the best in the world. To this end, the court has been engaged in crafting and executing a strategic plan to improve its efficiency. The court's vision is to be a world-class appellate court serving all stakeholders with excellence. Its mission statement, to serve all stakeholders with integrity and fairness by delivering sound, timely judgments and efficient, accessible court services in a healthy, fulfilling work environment. It will strive to achieve all these goals. Thank you very much, Mrs. Jared Fletcher. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, the Judicature Appellate Jurisdiction Act states that the Chief Justice may be invited to sit on the court when no less than four other judges are sitting. Today, 
although in this room we only have two along with the Chief Justice, we, the court is in fact sitting on bank and there are 12 other judges sitting today and so we can assure the Learned Chief Justice that we have complied with the provision of the Act and so I can properly call upon him, the Honorable Mr. Justice Brian Sykes, to address us. Thank you very much, President. I will adopt the order that you have so ably established at the commencement of the sitting. And let me just say welcome to all here present in court and those joining us online. It is indeed a significant occasion that we are celebrating both for the court and nationally. We're celebrating independence and taking charge of our own affairs. I, I suspect that in due course, whatever form it takes, full independent in terms of our legal affairs will occur. The history of the court has been ably recounted by Mrs. Jared Fletcher, and so I need not refer to that. So the question remains then, where do we go from here? We are now at the point where we have 13 judges, including the President of the Court of Appeal. We have a refurbished building, and we have full complement of judicial clerks, we also have a strategic plan for the judiciary overall, and we have a plan for each of the courts in Jamaica, including the Court of Appeal. And so that is an indication that the judiciary takes the whole question of efficiency. We still have some way to go, but it takes the whole business of efficiency and timely delivery of judgments very seriously. We know that the Court of Appeal is hampered with the question of delayed transcripts coming from the Supreme Court and from the parish courts. That is being addressed and so that will have to really be resolved technologically so that the whole question of having digital recording in the trial courts that must happen and the creation of a new occupational group called transcriptionists. Now, this is not to say that there is no room for court reporters, but the fact of the matter is that no new court reporter has been added to the cadre of court reporters for about the last decade or so. And so retirement will simply, it appears, bring that aspect of our court operations to an end unless the court reporting school is revived. But nonetheless, the future of modern judiciaries is digital, and so we have to move in that direction. And in that regard, we are developing a software, and it is being deployed in the courts. I won't say it is the appropriate software, but it is certainly much better than what we have in the courts. And so the manual system will gradually be replaced with the electronic system. And so in time, all the attorneys here present and those listening will be pleased to know that you'll be able to file your documents online and in electronic form. And so it reduces the question of the risk of loss, delayed hearings, and other associated matters with when you have paper-based um, hearings or documents where you utilize a lot of paper. The challenge for the current generation of appellate judges is to build upon the promise that began in 1962 and the legacy of the some 53 judges who have served this court in the past 60 years. And in so doing, I know that the president has embraced the need for modernizing the operations of the court. And so come next term, as I understand it, you may very well be seeing and experiencing differentiated case management. It is one of those tools that we have been using in the parish courts and also in the 
High Court Division of the Gun Court in Kingston. And what that has indicated to us statistically is that the High Court Division of the Gun Court in Kingston is actually backlog free. So we are doing cases that were done, brought into the court in 2021 and early 2022. We know from the parish courts that over 90% of the cases, criminal, civil, and family, are disposed of in 24 months that we know based upon six years of data. The problem, however, as I indicated, is getting now the transcripts from those courts into the Court of Appeal. And so that is being resolved. The final point I wish to mention is that I think the time has come where the courts need to have, and not that we haven't had it through our minister and minister of justice, but we need to have more regular and frequent dialogue with the executive where we speak about the needs of the judiciary and put ourselves in a position to become a world-class judiciary. The needs are not just in terms of the salaries and conditions of work, but also in, just in terms of keeping abreast of modern technology that can increase productivity of the courts because ultimately courts are designed to resolve disputes in a timely way. And that is our constitutional responsibility and one that we must always endeavor to meet. And so it is my commitment that we will continue to do that and we'll be seeking the cooperation of the bar and all the other court users. It only remains for me to congratulate the president and the judges of this court, both current judges and past judges for the excellent work that they have done in establishing this court as a court worthy of respect. I know that they will continue to uphold the high standards of integrity, fairness, when serving all stakeholders. And with that, I bring my remarks to an end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chief Justice. The eighth president of our court, who is our senior past president, is the Honorable Mr. Justice Ian Xavier Fort, Order of Jamaica, Commander of the Order of Distinction, retired. He served the court from 1999 to 2005 and saw some of the changes that the court underwent. He will bring us greetings via the Zoom platform. Good morning. My Lord President, my ladies and lords of the court, honorable ministers and honorable guests. Just wanted a correction. I served the court from January 1988 until 2005. I was president of the court from 1998 to 2005 when I retired. May I start by saying it is always an honor and personal privilege to participate in the activities of the Court of Appeal. I regret that circumstances do not allow me to be physically present in the court at this time when the court celebrates such a wonderful occasion of 60 years of its establishment. I'd like to reminisce a bit, if you'll allow me. When I was admitted to the bar in 19, October 1960, I think the Federation had existed at that time. Jamaica was a part of the federal government of the English, speaking Caribbean countries. And so it is that at that time we had a federal court of appeal. That court established very high standards in its execution of its hearings. And so when Jamaica chose to leave the Federation and become independent, 
an independent nation on its own. That's the reason why we had to establish the present court as we know it now. In those days, I think Mr. Justice Condal was appointed the first president, I stand to be corrected, but as far as I know, he never did sit. And as you know, there's some thing about that and the post of the Chief Justice was Mr. Justice McGregor at the time. So, President, my Lord President, you refer to many judges that serve on the court. I would like to, if I may, name some of them, hoping that I do not forget any, because when you reach on my age, you are likely to forget some things that you ought to remember. Ah, uh, let me see if I can find them. Yes, may I name some of them? My Lord President. Oh, Sir Cyril Sir Enriquez. Sir Cyril Enriquez. Justice Edon, Justice Joseph Lecou, Sir Roland Phillips, who subsequently became Chief Justice, and whose daughter joined you in the Court of Appeal and is now retired. Mr. Justice Shelley, Mr. Justice Swaby, Mr. Justice Swift was the first director of public prosecution in the independent Jamaica. And it was he who invited me to join him in the DPP's office. <clears throat> Justice Alan Lewis, I'm sure some of you must remember him. Justice Gerald Wallington, Justice Ken Henry, Justice Louis Fox, Justice Walter Wilkie, Justice Vin Melville, and of course, more recently, just not more recently, but he has been us up to recently, Justice Saka, who also served as Chief Justice of Jamaica, and with whom I had the pleasure of sitting in the islands of Cayman and the Turks Island. And of course, who can forget Mr. Justice Ken Smith, who also served as Chief Justice, Justice Darcy Carberry, and Justice Graham Perkins. In January 1988, I had the honor of being elevated to the Court of Appeal from the post of Director of Public Prosecutions. At that time, the full complement of the court, and I say full, I regard to numbers of judges that now sit in the Court of Appeal. There's President, Mr. Justice Ira Rowe, Mr. James Carr, Mr. Justice Boyd Carey, Mr. Justice Rock White, Mr. Justice Martin Wright, and Mr. UG, Justice UV Campbell. In those days, we sat in two divisions only. And uh, I know that before I got there, the court used to sit one division on Monday and one started on Wednesday. But by the time I got there, we sat four divisions on started on Monday. During my pleasure, and I really have to mention those who served with me. Much Morgan. We mentioned earlier, or somebody mentioned earlier, she was the first female judge in the, of Peel. Justice Anderson Downer, Justice Carl Patterson, who I see somewhere on the vid, on the screen. Mr. Justice Judy Gordon, Ralph Langren, Lindsay Wolf, who became Chief Justice, Algernon Smith. Howard Cook, Paul Harrison, 
Simon Seymour Panton, who I see here on the screen, and who has been in the news recently. Miss Justice McCullough, who also proceeded to be Chief Justice. And of course, Mr. Justice Walker. And not to leave him out, Mr. Justice Rattray, who was appointed from the private practice as the president of the court. If I've forgotten anybody, I hope I'll be forgiven for that. And uh, I'd like to say it has been in excess of 17 years since my retirement from the court. I'm not now familiar with all of these judges, but I do know some a little better than others. I take pride in revealing that I had the distinct pleasure of working with you, my Lord President, in the office of the DPP when I was DPP and you were Crown Council. From then, your potential for excellence was evident. Two of your judges also served as judicial clerks in the court before they qualified to practice at the bar. I might name them Miss Justice MacDonald Bishop and Ms. Justice Edwards. I have no doubt when they worked as judicial clerk that they would advance very far in the legal profession and they have not disappointed. In closing, my Lord President and distinguished guests, it is left only for me to wish the court God's wishes blessings. As you, my lords and ladies, continue to undertake the most important and arduous task of dispensing justice according to law. Increasingly, the people of Jamaica are turning to the judiciary to solve pressing social problems through cases presented in the courts. May the systematic and principled approach to the exercise of judicial discretion be always evident in the judgments of the court. May the conduct and deportment of the judges of the court always inspire confidence in the court. We may not all live to see another 60 years, but I'm sure the court will strive and excel to become, as my Lord Chief Justice mentioned, a world-class court of appeal. May you please you, my Lord President, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, I think I've said enough. Thanks for inviting me to participate in this wonderful ceremony. Thank you. Thank you very much, past President Fort. Apologies for the error in terms of our, our dates. As you see, these errors are not restricted to age. You are, you are correct in respect of President Condal. He was, in fact, the first appointed president of the court in 1962, uh, but he was ill for some time and so did not serve for much of the time that he was, in fact, the recorded president. Some of the names that you have mentioned, past President Fort, they brings back, bring back so many memories. And, and of course, for the younger ones who are with us, we see those names in the law reports where they, are, where they appear so many times. So thanks for bringing them to our memories this morning and that, that quick trip down memory lane. Thanks, thanks once again. Our next speaker is known to be an outstanding past member of the court. Not only outstanding, but outspoken. You always know where you stand with past president, the Honorable Mr. Justice Seymour Panton, Order of Jamaica, Command of the Order of Distinction. He introduced to the court two members who came from the private bar. And it may fairly be said 
gave an entirely fresh face and attitude to and of the court. I speak, of course, of Justices, the past president, Dennis Morrison, and Justice Hillary Phillips. Past President Panton will also bring us greetings by Zoom. Justice Panton. Hello, President. Um, did you say I should speak now? We would be very grateful if you would. Yes, and I will keep it in the time that you have mentioned. I want to accept your format for greetings, but I wish to particularly mention Honorable Mr. Justice Ford, with whom I served, and on the court. And to say that um, there's just one name Justice for it, that you omitted, and I will add it for you. And that's Justice Henderson Dona, um, who did um, add some vibrancy to the court. And President Brooks, I readily take credit for introducing those two judges that you mentioned. Um, I suspected that there was a tiny flack from the judiciary, some members of the judiciary for bringing in um, outsiders. But that is how the appellate system ought to work. It should not be confined to persons who are employed in the public service. In bringing greetings, I wish to say that I enjoyed my time on the Court of Appeal. Went there in 1998, December. I was sworn in to act the Saturday before Christmas. And it was really an enjoyable place to work. I enjoyed the camaraderie, the intellectual, the genuine intellectual exchanges, and the fact that although we had disagreements, we were definitely not disagreeable. I wish that the court will continue its path of integrity, dignity, and seeking to do justice for all. I commend the vision and the mission of the court, and I trust that the bar will cooperate with the bench with a view to ensuring justice. Now I have just a few more words to say. We in Jamaica have a tendency to object when change is proposed. Oh. I wish the members of the bar to remember, and if they do not remember, if they have not researched and have not come upon this, they ought to be told that there was a time when it was thought that there could be the training of lawyers in Jamaica. There was forcible opposition to the idea of training lawyers in Jamaica and in the Caribbean. It was said that you had to go to England. I ended up, people like me ended up in England doing the bar. 
So there was opposition to them being becoming, them becoming lawyers trained in the Caribbean. And having said that, I want the lawyers to remember to constantly bear in mind that much of their learning as lawyers came from and is still coming from serving judges in the region. They need to remember that. And I say that because I am shocked when I hear lawyers saying that they have no confidence in final court of appeal being the Caribbean and Jamaica acceding to such a court. How can they say something of that nature when they are being trained by the same judges? Consequently, I see Ms. Aina on the platform. It may be that the law school, in the same way we have to have a, a course in English for people to get into the universities, it may well be that Ms. Aina and others who head law schools in the region ask Professor Vereen Shepherd to present a paper in history of our region. Lawyers should not be thinking that final court is where you win. And if you win at the Privy Council, then that is where you ought to stay. Right? Say to them, use this medium to say to them, think what the late Sir Hugh Wooding and the late right excellent Norman Manley would be thinking were they alive and listening to such statements. I wish that in short order, the bar associations will insist that there be an accession to the Caribbean Court of Justice. The bar has been too silent on this matter. I don't know if it's because members of the bar, some are in politics, but they should not allow political views to influence their thinking in a matter of this nature. That is where I will leave this session this morning, my Lord President, and say thank you very much for inviting me to speak. And I assure everybody that I have no intention of being silent on this matter. As long as time is with me, I shall speak the Privy Council out of existence and bring the Caribbean Court of Justice into Jamaica's life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Past President Panton, the earlier mention of Justices Morrison and Phillips brought another error on my part. I failed to mention that just the Honorable Justice Dennis Morrison has his, his national honors, a member of the Order of Jamaica, commander of the Order of Distinction and before his accession to the bench was of Queen's Council, as was the, the Honorable Justice Phillips, who was also of Queen's Council, and she has honors, national honors. She's a commander of the Order of the Distinction. 
Ladies and gentlemen, having heard from the bench, serving and retired, we now call upon the bar. The leader of the bar traditionally is the Honorable Attorney General, Mr. Derek McCoy. He is represent unavoidably absent this morning, but is represented by Ms. Lisa White, the Deputy Solicitor General, and she will bring greetings on his behalf. May come to Thank you, my Lord President. I humbly accept the protocol as established. As said before, I represent the Attorney General's Chambers today and apologize for the absence of the Attorney General and Solicitor General, Queen's Counsel Dr. Derek McCoy and Mrs. Marlene Aldred, who are unavoidably absent. They send their best regards to the Court of Appeal and commendations on the excellent work and delivery of justiciable decisions from this August court. As we have learned, in 1962, the Court of Appeal of Jamaica emerged from merely being a division of the Supreme Court of Jamaica to being constituted on its own as the Court of Appeal for Jamaica. It was a new court at that time and, was, and has evolved into a critical organ of the judiciary in the establishment, upholding, and the observance of the rule of law in Jamaica. Whether adjudicating in election petitions, establishing civil procedural norms, or assessing the fairness of a criminal trial for a matter that proceeded in a court below, or even considering important cases involving the Industrial Disputes Tribunal, the Court of Appeal is a court for Jamaicans and a court for Jamaica. The Court of Appeal is a critical component of the rule of law and the maintenance of order in our beloved land. And this is evident in its pronouncements in judicial review and constitutional matters and the determination of private law remedies. The late right excellent Norman Washington Manley, who was also Queen's Counsel and national hero of Jamaica, after arranging for Jamaica's orderly withdrawal from the Federation, established a joint committee to determine the constitution of Jamaica for Jamaica's independence. As more and more Jamaicans pray in aid the constitution, we anticipate that the Court of Appeal will definitely continue to refine the law and provide guidance as to the principles to be espoused for the supreme law of the land. As we celebrate 60 years of the Court of Appeal, we anticipate that in the future, the Court of Appeal will indeed continue to excel. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. White. Please convey our thanks to the Honorable Attorney General for his kind words. The Director of Public Prosecutions, Ms. Paula Llewellyn, Queen's Council, has also reminded us in dispatches that her office was also created by the Constitution on the 6th of August, 1962. And so that office shares this milestone with the court. Ms. Llewellyn has appeared before this court many times over the years, I'm sure more times than she can count. And she no doubt would have seen some of the changes that the court has undergone. So we call upon the Honorable Director of Public Prosecutions to Address us. May it please you, my lords and ladies of the Court of Appeal, lords and ladies, current and past, 
and of course to my colleagues at the bar. May I confess, my Lord President, that as I heard my former Director of Public Prosecutions, Mr. Justice Ian Fort, and I heard him taking us back in time, the very human side of me was almost teary-eyed. Yes, I confess, even I can cry. Because it took me back to some wonderful times that I have spent in the Court of Appeal. Not to mention the sleepless nights in respect of the preparation. I do recall the Bernal and Moore case where I spent myself and Miss Pike seven weeks before Mr. Justice Ford, President of the Court of Appeal, Mr. Justice Wolf, and Mr. Justice Henderson Downer. And I was up against Mr. Ian, Ian um, Ramsey, Queen's Counsel, and Mr. Richard Small, along with other lawyers. And it took me two or three weeks after the end of that case to resume my normal sleep pattern. So demanding it was. But the Court of Appeal, to my mind, has always been the creme de la creme of finishing schools in terms of learning the law. It is well known that I love appearing before the jury at first instance. But I'm the first person to tell all Crown Council that you don't really learn the law on a micro and granular level until you have appeared in the Court of Appeal. And certainly on behalf of the staff, past and current, of the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, I wish to salute the Court of Appeal in your celebration of an establishment of 60 years. Uh, we share it. I'm a humble prosecutor, but I'm pleased to say that we do share that milestone as well, and we will be having celebrations going on through the year. And perhaps I could say that there are two things that will stand out for the Office of the DPP as it relates to the Court of Appeal in honor of us sharing the 60 years. We have now established a new unit, in addition to our many other units, anti-gang, extradition, mutual legal assistance, and other units. We now have established this year, my Lord President, a Court of Appeal unit headed by a Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions. We have our own dedicated email for that unit, and we are doing some restructuring. We are digitizing all the files, and we will be trying to make sure that we are even more responsive in making sure that we extend all professional courtesies so that we will have responsiveness. So that will be in honor of what we share this year, the Court of Appeal unit in the office of DPP. And also it was my signal honor to appear in the first case coming from the right of appeal that has been granted finally to the office of the DPP. And I did appear earlier this year in a matter and we await the judgment. So in respect of the celebration of the Court of Appeal, those two things will certainly stand out. And as I close, I do recall so many great judgments that have been written. I see that your mission statement is saying, serving all stakeholders with excellence. But from the time of the establishment of this court, from what we have all read, in the judgments, in the cases, that has been a constant of this body. And I wish um, all the very best as you continue to ma maintain and even further excel in, in these judgments. Your Lordship mentioned the Peter Dugall matter. I think of recent events, but I was the person up who appeared for the Crown in that matter. And it is really, truly a wonderful, wonderful institution 
that has been built. I remember Mistress Madge Morgan, who was a family friend, and when I saw that she was appointed as a young prosecutor, as the first female in the Court of Appeal, it affirmed for me the fact that keen intellectual acuity transcends gender and that the glass ceiling that was then shattered, that it could have been shattered in other areas of legal endeavor. And um, it is good to know that perhaps one day we will see, I'm sure, a president of the Court of Appeal who will be of the female gender. It's a process and it is progress and it's, it's all about what will happen. So my lords and my ladies, thank you very much for the kind invitation and we pledge at the office of the DPP that although sometimes the going is very rough, that we will continue ourselves to offer excellence as advocates at the public bar in respect of the preparation and presentation of our cases before the Court of Appeal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Director. I, I know our registrar has taken mental note of the establishment of that unit at the director's office, and I'm sure you will be in touch with her in respect of that. More and on. The freshly minted chairman of the General Legal Council is Mrs. Denise Kitson, Queen's Counsel. She has also appeared many times before this court, and we call upon her for greetings. May it so please you, my Lord President, and other judges of the court, my Lord Chief Justice, judges of the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, all other distinguished attendees today, present in court and on the virtual platform. This is a signal honor for me I am indeed delighted to bring greetings on behalf of the General Legal Council as we celebrate the 60th anniversary of the establishment of the Court of Appeal. Jamaicans are known to welcome any occasion to celebrate. And today we do so in even greater measure as at the core of a people's longing is the need for justice. that which has and is at the heart of our laws. This no doubt informed the establishment of this court on the eve of the nation's independence. We can all agree that except perhaps in some criminal matters, this court is for most of our citizens the final avenue for determination of their disputes. And of course, we have heard, as my Lord Panton has never hesitated to state, why it is that this is our final court in many of these matters. And for many of us, that is not a negative. In fact, it has proven to be very positive because this court has delivered. It concretizes in its jurisprudence the fulfillment of that need for justice. And if I may add a personal note, let me also remember my lady Madge Morgan, who for me as a child was a mentor, an encourager, and in fact caused me perhaps to pursue this path in the profession that we love and pursue. But today, I salute the court, its judges, past and present, 
registrars, judicial clerks, and all other support staff who by their unstinting service, regardless of the conditions, have striven to ensure that the body of work of the Court of Appeal over these 60 years is as brilliant and durable as the diamond which, which symbolizes this anniversary. Indeed, you have fulfilled the words of the prophet Michael, who requires us to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. May it please my Lord, my ladies. Thank you very much, Queen's Council. Also fairly new to the post of another important institution in the legal landscape in Jamaica is Mr. Alexander Williams, president of the prestigious Jamaican Bar Association, who will now address us. <clears throat> My Lord Chief Justice, my Lord President, um, my Lords and Ladies in this room and remotely joining us, my learned friends all, <clears throat> forgive me, I'm a little bit under the weather that I'm going to largely abandon. And I'm beginning this way because there is a crescendo in the public space, a matter of general public importance, which began, in my mind, certainly since I've been president of the Bar Association, with the contribution of uh, President Morrison at the Bar Dinner last year. And that crescendo has continued with um, President Saunders of the Caribbean Court of Justice at a function recently attended. And I've heard it again today by past President Pantan, who I should indicate I admire for his candor and his bluntness. Um, and it has to do, of course, with that institution. And I dare say it has proven itself time and time again. I'd like to, and I hope you'll forgive me for saying this, and I'm speaking directly to past President Patton, that um, political affiliation, wherever it may reside, will not color the position taken by the Jamaican Bar Association. We have heard the calls. And there is a process that the association needs to adhere to before coming to a position on the issue. I am particularly interested in two things, and I'm speaking here for myself. The development of a Caribbean jurisprudence number of issues pop into my mind, which I feel should be settled in a final Caribbean way. One has to do with the topic or the issue of adverse possession, which has gone through a tortured um, analysis by the, final, the current final court. Um, there are other issues, judge-made law, that need to be settled in a way in which we can, and I know I'm going to get into trouble for this, fulfill the independence experiment, which began 60 years ago. So I'd just like to say in this forum that Certainly my ears are not deaf, Bar Association is not deaf, and this is one of the central issues that needs to be grappled with in a very timely, timely way. The association is pleased to 
participate in these celebrations. 60 years ago, the law which ultimately created the Court of Appeal allowed Jamaica to take one of its first steps towards ensuring justice and the protection of rights of our people. And since then, we have all arrived in, we have all strived rather, in this profession to achieve the goals of developing and importantly, preserving the administration of justice to those who seek it. It is through this diligence and unwavering dedication that has allowed the Court of, Court of Appeal to maintain its high standard in the quality of its judgments. And with this excellence, justice has been delivered in a courteous and a timely manner. We express gratitude to the staff of the Court of Appeal learned registrars, deputy registrars, and all state and non-state actors for ensuring that this quality is maintained and delivered by aligning with our core idea of justice and its development to the highest standard. I'd like to leave us with a thought. Um, how can we leverage justice and the administration of justice in an economic way. London is regarded as um, capital for the resolution of maritime disputes internationally. Switzerland is acknowledged as a jurisdiction for arbitration both in the area of sports law, which I'm fairly familiar with, and in the area of other types of, com uh, other types of commercial litigation. Can we consider creating the Caribbean as a go-to jurisdiction for the resolution of similar disputes? We can achieve this by a final court that is recognized globally to resolve those disputes. And we will do so by adherence to jurisprudence that we develop in a particular way. So it is not just for fulfilling um, the independence experiment that we consider the issues of our final court it may well be part of our economic plan. It may well be part of how we go about seeking the kind of, and I'm not being political here, the prosperity that we'd like to have in Jamaica. I am very pleased again to be afforded this opportunity, especially to assuage any concern Anyone may wish to have as to whether or not the Bar Association is listening. We are listening, and we, we, we expect to announce a position very shortly on that signal matter of general public importance. May it so please you. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. Mr. Leonard Green is a very special friend of this court. He does not appear here that often anymore, but he does give us some cameos from time to time. However, he always gives this court his unstinting support. And during the course of this week, we have seen him... <laughs> at all our events that are open to the public and he was at our church service he was at our lecture and dinner on Wednesday and so it is with great pleasure that we ask Mr. Green to address us this morning Mate. 
May it please you, Lord President, may it please you, Chief Justice, Honorable Judges of the Court of Appeal, it is my pleasure, and indeed I am grateful to have, to be given the opportunity to represent the Advocates Association of Jamaica at this function. The Court of Appeal has given service to this nation for the past 60 years. And that has been valued service. And advocates throughout the length and breadth of Jamaica recognize the worth of this court. There are times when advocates and lawyers do not agree with the court. And that is understandable. We do recognize that that notwithstanding, the worth and value of this institution has been accepted by all of us who practice at the bar. I recognize as well that we will never be able to hang on to the coattails of the judicial the Privy Council. And there will come a time when we must lead our own path. And I support that. I want to take the opportunity, sir, to recognize the registry that you have developed over the years. I know Ms. Brown would want to know that I never forget the work they have provided to the, to the Court of Appeal. And it is a vast improvement over the years. It has been lawyer friendly, and I encourage them in that regard. Now, in all that have been said, I think may it please you, my lord, that as a nation, we have done well. 60 years as a nation is probably a short time. I appreciate, my Lord Chief Justice, your efforts to improve. And that is really what we ought to recognize when we are on a journey. The improvements, timely delivery, the public look to us, to the courts, to the advocates, to provide a service, a fair service, which is just. Over the years, may it please you, my Lord President, and judges of the appeal, we have done well. In representing the Advocates Association of Jamaica, I say we have to do better for the public that we serve in providing justice that they are entitled to. I close by thanking you, my Lord President, for giving us the opportunity to bring <coughs> greetings on this very special occasion. Thank you again, Mr. Green, President of the Advocates Association of Jamaica. Another friend of the court who also sits on the advisory board of the court administration division Ms. Perline Bailey, president of the Northern Bar Association. <laughs> now address us. My Lord President, Honorable Chief Justice, judges of the Court of Appeal, it is with honor that I stand here on behalf of the Northern Jamaica Law Society to bring greetings to celebrate the 60th anniversary of our independence and self-governance of which this Court of Appeal has played an integral part. As we do so, I want to remind us to be proud of our accomplishments 
Certainly over the past 60 years, we have taken significant strides in achieving a more modern, efficient, accessible, and fair justice system. We have achieved a more perfect system, but there is far more work to be done. The progress we have achieved, my lords, in the system was not automatic or inevitable. Every step of the way, it took the sacrifice, the suffering, the struggle, and the tireless exertions and passionate concerns of dedicated individuals who had a vision of what we could become and who worked tirelessly towards achieving it. We are not where we would like to be, as the Chief Justice has indicated. We suffer from a lack of resources and are sometimes held back by a bureaucracy, which though necessary, can be a hindrance. In the administration of justice, I wish to remind us all that we live in a time where our people are more mindful and watchful of what we do and how we do it. They have stronger opinions on the administration of justice and are more vociferous in expressing those opinions. We live in a society where sometimes the wrong social media coverage can bring our system into disrepute where no such disrepute in fact exists. As such, we have to be careful to guard against a certain perception and to ensure that our behavior within the system is above reproach. So for the next 60 years, I say that we should strive, as we strive to improve legislation, law enforcement, the courts, and the corrections, we should remember that the cry of the poor is not always just, but if you don't listen to it, you will never know what justice is. We must also remind ourselves that if we do not maintain justice, justice will not maintain us. I thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Bailey. And of course, I have to apologize. Ms. Bailey is the president of Jamaica, Northern Jamaica Law Society. Mr. Michael Hemmings is the president of the Cornwall Bar Association. And he was also present with us on Wednesday evening. He's with us this morning and he will now address the court. May it please you, my Lord President, the Honorable Chief Justice, judges of the Court of Appeal, present and retired judges of the Supreme Court, colleagues, friends, and all, pleasant good morning. It was in July I got an email for an invitation to celebrate an institution that is two decades, eight years older than I am. I accepted the invitation and I'm here this morning. And some adjectives came to mind, integrity, deportment, decorum, fairness, and those objectives are very important because they kept the very fabric of this institution going over 60 years and we will continue to go for another 60 years. It is therefore the Common Bar Association pledge that we will abide by guidelines and policies that will continue to adhere and see the betterment of our judicial system. On behalf of the Common Bar Association, we bring greetings in celebrating this historic moment. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, Mr. Haying. Thanks for your very kind words. And we now call upon Mr. George Clue, who has also been very supportive of us this week. He's the president of the Southern Bar Association, and we ask for his greeting.
Honorable President, I accept and endorse the protocol that you have already established. It is my privilege to address such a distinguished audience in this our 68th year of independence and the 60th year of this court. I'll be very brief in my remarks. As a body, we've made strides since independence to create a highly efficient and modern judicial system capable of meeting the needs for, of our country during our various stages of development. While we celebrate our many achievements, we should also renew and rejuvenate ourselves, lest we become stagnant and fail to achieve our great destiny. Today, we celebrate those who have served and continue to serve tirelessly at this level of the judiciary. I'm pleased on behalf of the Southern Bar Association to bring these few words. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Clue. The court is part of that third and equal arm of the state. The other arms, of course, are the legislature and the executive. And this morning, we have been pleased to have the presence and support of members of, the, of both other arms. We've had the President of the Senate, the Honorable Speaker of the House of Representatives, and from the Executive, of course, the Honorable Minister of Justice and the Honorable Minister of Constitutional and Legal Affairs. And we welcome you all. The court cannot bring this sitting to an end without expressing thanks to all the many people who have contributed to bringing this sitting to fruition. Indeed, this, this entire week has been the result of a lot of planning and hard work by our team at the Court of Appeal and by the many members of the Court Administration Division of the Supreme Court. There's also a risk, always a risk of offending when one begins to name individuals as inevitably someone will be omitted. But I would be remiss not to publicly recognize and thank some of the major contributors to the planning of these celebrations. Someone said to me yesterday that the team effort over the past few months have helped to cement the camaraderie and cooperation between the team here at the court. I must therefore first recognize the anniversary planning committee, which has been meeting since February of this year. They are the Honorable Mrs. Justice Marva MacDonald Bishop, Commander of the Order of Distinction, the Honorable Miss Justice Carol Edwards, Commander of the Order of Distinction, the Honorable Miss Justice Nicole Simmons, our Registrar, Mrs. Stacey Ann Brown, Mr. Adriel, Adriel Williams, Judicial Clerk, and Mrs. Verna Mogor, Senior Executive Secretary. They are our in-house team members. We were ably supplementing in significant ways, including the provision of financing and the execution of our various plans by Mrs. Tricia Cameron Anglin, the Director of the Court Administration Division, Mrs. Kadish Jared Fletcher, who just came through the door, Mrs. Anne Marie Cummings, Mrs. Janet Duffus Beale. That team was the, were the conceptualizers and drivers of the various plans that came to fruition this week. Your humble servant, of course, was also a member 
of that team. And while the team did the overall planning, the execution was carried out by so many others. Our church service was held at the St. Peter and Paul Church, Roman Catholic Church, and we were graciously hosted by the pastor, Reverend Roger, Re, Reverend Roger Graham, and the congregation there. Our, court of, our CAD team, the Court Administration Division team, provided the logistics, including the technical support. Mrs. Duffus Beale and Mr. Jelani Klahar did the groundwork in regard to the organizing the visit and printing the programs for the church service, while Messrs. Shane Gilpin and Shadrick Wilson worked tirelessly in getting the technology aspect in place. The cameras, the sound, lights, as they did for all our events this week. Our Court of Appeal Choir did a stirring rendition, rendition of the Lamb of God for the congregation. Our next event was our anniversary lecture and dinner. And our guest speaker, the Honorable Mr. Justice Adrian Saunders, President of the Caribbean Court of Justice, was the icing on the cake. But a lot of organization, a lot of work, a lot of planning went into putting that cake together. Apart from the planning committee, members who all doubled up in that regard, and we had other members who, of the team who chipped in magnificently. The Honorable Mr. Justice David Fraser was the master of ceremonies of the evening, and he kept the session going and people laughing. The Honorable Ms. Justice Jennifer Straw did the opening prayer. The Honorable Mr. Mrs. Justice Nicole Foster Pusey did the vote of thanks. And in between, the Honorable Justice, Justices Frank Williams, Paulette Williams, Carol Edwards, Nicole Simmons, and Evan Brown added an unsurpassable flair in escorting our awardees to the platform. Judicial Clerk Mrs. Rochelle McCallum did a spirited introduction of our guest speaker, while our other judicial clerks checked invitations and did ushering duties. The planning committee members also worked on getting flowers, tokens, entertainment, lists, and other necessaries in place. And we wish to thank all our guests who turned out that evening. We enjoyed our presence, and we hope that you had a good time with us on Wednesday. Justice Saunders' Justice attendance was also the result of a lot of planning. Mrs. Jared Fletcher and Mr. Clahar led the way in this regard on this side of the Caribbean. Assisting them were close protection officers who conducted Justice Saunders safely on his various trips. And one of those was as early as 5.30 in the morning on Thursday. Thanks also to His Excellency the Governor General and his staff who graciously hosted Justice Saunders in a courtesy call at King House, King's House. On the other side of the Caribbean was Justice Saunders' team led by Miss Deborah Gibbs. Our third event was the opening of our anniversary exhibition. It was open to the public since Tuesday morning of this week, the 2nd of August, but had its official opening yesterday. Its conceptualizing, planning, and execution were done almost exclusively by the dynamic duo of the Honorable Ms. Justice Carol Edwards and Mr. Adriel Williams. They got help from a number of people who contributed paraphernalia to the cause. Those included the Chief Justice, and we thank, thank you and your office, sir, for lending us photographs. Mr. Stuart Stimson, whose 
creativity provided us with artwork in the form of caricatures of sitting judges. Justice is straw and justice is done by a green. Justice is straw and done by a green for providing other material for the exhibition, photographs, and uh, other paraphernalia for the, for the exhibition. Justices MacDonald Bishop and retired Justice Hillary Phillips were the moving forces in our fourth event. It featured a number of skits, including teaching the ethical principles that should guide, that should guide judges and employees in any court. Although I've used the term skits, these were in the form of short movies, expertly filmed and reproduced, and showing the vast reservoir of talent that is in the court. That filming and production was done by one of our close protection officers, Constable Kenroy, Kenroy Martin, who also provided music and video footage for the skits. We had budding acting talent exhibited during the day and in those movies. Among those were judicial clerks, Mr. Hamilton, Mrs. Nelson Gale, Mrs. McCallum, Ms. Wallace, Mrs. Wilson Christie, and Mrs. Brown McIntosh. Other members of the staff also strutted their self, stuff. These included Mrs. Thomas, Mr. Francis, Mr. Allen, Corporal Wilson, Constable Grant, who made cameo appearances along with several others. And we had some interesting names, Minister, in those skits that would bring a smile to your face. The, back in the day, we had MC duties performed, back to the day, we, we had MC duties performed by the Honorable Mrs. Ms. Justice Paulette Williams and DJ duties provided by the Honorable Mr. David, Justice David Fraser. As it was a complete team effort, almost everyone from every tier of the court performed as part of the Court of Appeal Choir, which took the rehearsals seriously and work, the work paid off. You should have seen Justice Almary Sinclair Haynes as part of that choir rocking in the background. Similarly, there was refreshment and even a dance competition where all had an enjoyable time. The registrar, Mrs. Stacey Ann Brown, provided photography services, while our court administrator, Mrs. Judith White, and her team ensured that we were safe and kept in due bounds. And finally, today's sitting. Mrs. Jared Fletcher and her team from the Court Administration Division took the lead in getting the technology to perform for us. Thanks to all the individuals who have joined us in person and on the various electronic platforms. Thanks to the media for taking this ceremony to those many people who have had the interest to see and hear today's sitting. There are a number of behind the scenes jobs which had to be done for without them, there would be chaos. The management of the invitations, the issue and the receiving of the responses were done by our oh, Mrs. Verna McGaw. Publicity was ensured by Mr. Adriel Williams and Mrs. Stacey Ann Brown. And delivery of invitations was done by Mr. Dumetz and Ms. Gordon. Despite our best efforts, we made mistakes. I made mistakes. And some of them were protocol errors which caused offense and dissatisfaction. We apologize sincerely for those errors and hope that we will be forgiven. I know that even with this extensive list of names, I have left out some persons. And again, I ask for your pardon for not mentioning you individually. But rest assured that your efforts are well appreciated and we thank you all. Thanks very much also to our guests today who are attending both in person and online. We particularly thank the President, President of the Senate, 
the Honorable Senator, the Honorable Tom Tavares Simpson, who unfortunately had to leave, not only for attending today, although he had, uh, has other duties this afternoon at Parliament, but while he was wearing the hat of the Chairman of the Board of the National Gallery, graciously hosted Justice Saunders at the gallery. Thanks also to the Honorable Mrs. Marissa dalrymple Philibert, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, who has also taken the time to share with us despite the matters of state which he has to attend to today. And of course, Justices Chuck and Malahu Fort, who have also graced us to the, this morning. We appreciate the effort of all who have attended in person and online, and we wish you all the very best. Thank you. My, my learned sister has reminded me it is Minister Chuck and Minister. <laughs> we, we are grateful and of course we cannot end without saying our great, grateful thanks to the Chief Justice for all his support that he has given to the court not only this week, but throughout the time that he has been in this position. He has been a great friend of the court, and we look forward to your continued support, sir. Thank you. All having been said, Madam Registrar, please adjourn this special sitting of the Court of Appeal. Please stand.